Um, mortality is an essential component of human nature, yet literature, film, and other forms of popular culture are replete with examples of figures who occupy liminal spaces, such as the space between life and death, and they thus challenge the very nature of these boundaries which they transgress. Two shining examples to illustrate dilemmas related to such representations can be seen in the Fox television series Fringe through a character named Alistair Peck, who appears in the White Tulip episode, and in the 2009 film Terminator Salvation with the character of Marcus Wright, played by Sam Worthington. Both of these characters complicate binaries between life and death, as well as between human, post-human, man and machine, and thinking and programming. Moreover, both Wright and Peck challenge conventional views on mortality. Indeed, both Wright and Peck work well as cases in point to illustrate how messy ontological categories can get. By provoking boundaries, characters such as Wright and Peck force us to re-examine what it means to be human in the 21st century, and they also push us to question how we understand ourselves as human beings. In the case of Marcus Wright, viewers and characters struggle with determining what exactly Marcus Wright is, since he is part human and part Terminator. He was a death row inmate who donated his body to science, thus he's reborn as a hybrid figure. There was a pivotal scene in Terminator Salvation when John Connor, um, the series star and the leader of the resistance, sees circuitry in Marcus Wright's abdominal cavity. You'll see that on the handout. And he thus declares that Wright is, quote, not human. Wright nonetheless insists he is human, yet later in the film both Connor and Wright are forced to reassess their initial stance. Indeed, scenes which occurred late in the film, as well as the film's resolution, only further complicate this matter since the film's resolution hinges on Wright sacrificing himself, in essence giving up both his immortality and his post-human existence to save John Connor's life. What complicates the discussion of these characters is that the bodies of Alistair Peck and Marcus Wright have been altered and technologically aug augmented to such a degree that technology defines their very existence as much, if not more so, than their human nature. In his article, Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk and Information Technology, Steve Jones argues that the parallels we draw between machines and living things strongly color our understanding of the world. He emphasizes that now, since information is so central to biology, life is thought of as genetic code, and much like a machine, is available for editing. With um, these remarks in mind, the fictional situations I'll be discussing highlight the type of ethical dilemmas that might one day come to pass as human beings continue to co-evolve with technology. A closer examination of these examples will illustrate this contention. An American science fiction TV series, Fringe centers on investigations conducted by the Fringe Division, a branch of the FBI. The show follows agents Olivia Dunham um, and her colleagues, as well as scientist Dr. Wash Robert, um, Dr. Walter Bishop and Walter's son, FBI consultant Peter Bishop, as they investigate cases relating to Fringe science. A subject which is not only significant to White Tulip, which is the episode about Alistair Peck, but which remains a recurring theme of the series, is the relationship between humans and technology. Indeed, many of the episodes feature transhumanist experiments, and there is a repeated focus in the series about the many ethical dilemmas such experimentation presents. Discussing the series as a whole, Phil Smolensky and Charlene Elsby argue that, quote, Fringe provides us with the opportunity to consider abstract questions about the ethical significance of scientific advancement. As a series, Fringe remains concerned with the limits, ethical as well as other, of science, and to be sure, White Tulip is noteworthy in this respect. Not only does the episode focus on transhumanist experimentation, but though the um, episode has a standalone plot, it remains nonetheless very much tied to the series' overarching concerns in mythology. However, despite the clear connection between the episode and the series as a whole, the events that make up White Tulip never make it into the French Division's case files, thanks to a paradox created by Alistair's Peck time travel. So none of the members of the French team have memories of what has transpired. This is because their memories are effectively erased every time Peck resets the timeline via his time travel. Far from being incidental, this feature of the episode serves a particular function because significantly, Peck is able to send Dr. Walter Bishop an anonymous message in the form of the drawing of a white tulip back through time. The message is the sign that Dr. Bishop has been waiting for and a key to him reconciling his past and rep re repairing his relationship with his son. White Tulip begins much like other episodes in the series. The team is called to investigate an unusual occurrence. When they arrive, however, they discover a train full of cars, uh, a train car full of dead bodies, 
and they are also presented with an unsettling mystery to solve since there's no readily apparent cause of death. Uh, Dr. Bishop learns that all of the uh, victims have one thing in common. Their personal electronic devices were drained of power. He formulates a theory that someone or something drew energy from the people and their electronics. An eyewitness puts Dr. Peck, an astrophysics professor at MIT, at the scene. So the French team visits his home. While they're inside, Peck comes home, but he manages to escape by using his time travel device. The opening sequence of the scene then essentially repeats itself as the team is called once again to the same train station. This time around, Agent Dunham, however, experiences a feeling of deja vu, so the team is able to piece together clues more quickly, allowing Dr. Bishop to read Dr. Peck's work and speculate about his use of a time travel device. He learns that Peck's fiance was killed in a car accident, and he starts to believe Peck is trying to travel back in time to save her. Bishop eventually confronts Peck with this theory, and he tries to discourage him from making any further back jump back, jumps back in time, telling him that the price would be too high because it would drain life from anyone in the vicinity, and there would be no reset this final time. So the victims, in essence, would stay dead. Peck tells Bishop that he's already considered this, and because of this concern, he's found a field near where he needs to jump, and he says he'll land there, um, causing only loss to plant life. Dr. Bishop still tries to dissuade Peck, saying that some lines should never be crossed. Peck, however, does jump back in time. He ends up in the field like he promised, giving himself just minutes to reach his fiance. When he reunites with her, though, he changes his mind. He does not pull her from the car, which was his original plan. Instead, he tells her he loves her. Moments later, they both get killed in the same auto collision. Before the episode ends, the camera pans in to Dr. Bishop, where the events have never occurred because of the time travel paradox, and he receives the drawing of the white tulip in the mail. Uh, beyond contributing to the series' overarching mythology, this episode is provocative for the way it ultimately merges ethical with ontological questions. Dr. Peck is described as a cyborg scientist who makes the ultimate sacrifice to reconnect with the love of his life by embedding mechanical probes in his chest to propel his body through time. That's the other picture from the handout. By grafting this technology onto his body, Peck transforms into something other than human. And in fact, Peck becomes the literalization of the metaphor that it's impossible to separate man from his tools. Yet, yet Peck's motives for crossing this line are all too human, since his invention, use, and ultimate merging of technology is the direct result of him wanting to save the woman he loves. In this manner, the character of Peck complicates the binaries between human, post-human, man-machine, and thinking and programming. As a character, Peck works well as both a foil and a parallel to Dr. Bishop, who's presented in the series as a modern-day Dr. Frankenstein. While Peck pushes the boundaries even further than Dr. Bishop does by actually becoming one with technology and thus becoming post-human, he stops short of Dr. Bishop's ambitions, and he resists the view that science should operate independent of ethical concerns by his ultimate decision to die with his fiance. As much as he wants to pull her from the car and save her life, he seems to understand that there are some things scientists shouldn't do, even if it's within their power. His decision shows both respect for human life and humility. He's not willing to kill innocent humans in the name of scientific progress, nor is he ultimately willing to play God by saving his fiancée Arlette, though it's in his power to do so. By the end of the episode, Peck, although he may be post-human, demonstrates that he's not at odds with humanity. Ultimately, by sacrificing himself and choosing to die along with his fiance, he turns away from a post-human existence and toward mortality, since it means reuniting with the woman he loves. Moreover, unlike Dr. Bishop, whose many scientific discoveries have ended up in the wrong hands, Peck also effectively destroys the technology he created, and along with it, the means to travel through time when he perishes along with his fiance, Arlette. Um, Terminator Salvation is the fourth installment of the Terminator franchise. It is set in 2018 in a post-apocalyptic Earth populated by a small group of human resistance fighters. The central conflict of the film is the war between the embattled human collectives and cyborg armies. Even though John Connor, the leader of the resistance and the series protagonist, plays a role in the film, the narrative actually follows another character, Marcus Wright. Wright first appears in the year 2003 as a death row inmate. He's being persuaded by Dr. Serena Kogan to donate his body to science. 
She tells him that allowing his body to be used for medical research will be a way for him to atone for his crimes, and he, albeit reluctantly, agrees. Marcus Wright next appears in 2018. He's in Los Angeles. He looks disoriented. To um, onlookers, including the teenage Kyle Reese and another child named Star, it seems that Wright is in jeopardy. So they intervene by destroying a nearby T-600 model that they perceive to be as a threat. Wright acts confused when he meets them, asking Reese and Star what year it is. He also claims to have no knowledge of the ongoing war between humanity and Skynet. The three leave together to find other humans, but another attack occurs, separating them. Marcus travels on his own for a while, but he eventually comes across a woman named Blair, and the two of them head to her base, which is run by John Connor, who is the de facto leader of the resistance. Directly outside the base, Marcus is badly injured by a magnetic landmine. Blair rushes him inside so they can give him medical assistance. The medical team, led by John Connor's wife, Kate, sees metal in his leg, and at first mistakes him for a human being with a prosthetic leg. Moments later, however, when they spy circuitry in his abdominal cavity, and again, that's in the picture, they determine that he's not human, that he's a cyborg, as the exchange, which I'm about to read, reveals. John Connor says, the devil's hands have been busy. What is it? Kate says, it's real flesh and blood, though it seems to heal itself quickly. The heart is human and very powerful, the brain too, but with a chip interface. Marcus Wright, what have you done to me? Kate Connor. It has a hybrid nervous system, one human cortex, one machine. Marcus Wright, Blair, what have they done? John Connor says, who built you? Marcus Wright says, my name is Marcus Wright. John Connor, he says, you think you're human? Marcus Wright says, I am human. Indeed, even when confronted by John and Kate Connor, Marcus nonetheless maintains that he is a human being. For his part, John insists that Marcus is a machine, nothing more. And Connor believes that Marcus has been programmed specifically to find and execute him. Marcus, with the help of Blair, gets free and tries to escape, but John and others pursue him. As the chase ensues, there's a raid from Skynet's Hydrobots, and in it, Marcus saves John's life, thereby forcing John to reconsider his position. John admits at that point he doesn't know what to make of Marcus. Marcus, for his part, tells John Connor that he's no longer sure either, but he says, I do need to find out who did this to me. They agree to go together to Skynet's headquarters, where Wright will assist Connor in rescuing Kyle Reese and other human prisoners. When Marcus enters the base, he interfaces with the com computer, allowing um, the perimeter to drop and John to enter. Once inside, Marcus is confronted by Skynet. He asks Skynet, who is projecting in the image of Serena Kogan, what am I? Skynet tells him he was created and built as an infiltration model. Skynet further tells him that he has executed his programming brilliantly by bringing John Connor back. Marcus, however, refuses to believe that he's only a machine, and in protest rips out the hardware linking him to Skynet. He further defies Skynet by helping John. Although Marcus helps um, John defeat the Terminator model, John receives um, critical injuries, and he has to be airlifted out. The medical team tries to help John, but his heart is too badly damaged. Despite protests from Blair, who recognizes Marcus as fully human, despite what others may believe, Marcus, Marcus offers his own heart for transplant, and he thus ends up sacrificing himself to save John's life. The manner in which the film ends not only raises a host of ethical questions and ontological questions, but it also represents a departure for the franchise. While historically speaking, the, um, the series provided a us-versus-them worldview, one which fails to acknowledge the dialectical relation between humans, technology, and machine, this polarity takes a strange turn in Terminator Salvation. Uh, Kimberly Rosenfeld um, talks about this in her article, Terminator to Avatar, a Postmodern Shift. Instead of clearly delineating man versus machine, which was the trend in earlier Terminator films, Terminator Salvation moves beyond this dichotomy. The attempt by machines, in this case Skynet, to make a hybrid man-machine results instead in the creation of a being who can't find his place in either world. The outcome of the experimentation on Marcus is that he's not either a man or a machine or a problematic third wheel to the human monster binary. Indeed, the case of Marcus Wright blurs boundaries even as he calls attention to and problematizes them. There's no doubt that whatever else he may be, he is an enhanced and improved human but even this description falls short of addressing his relationship to the binary. Only further complicating matters, 
Marcus is not fully self-aware. Indeed, he doesn't realize until about halfway through the film that he's part machine. When he discovers, only after delivering John Connor to Skynet, that he is part of a scheme to kill Connor, Marcus then humanly defies the programming. Furthermore, he insists upon his own humanity by declaring, I know what I am, even as he rips the hardware link from his cortex. Even if Marcus has persuaded himself that he is human, others are not similarly convinced. Skynet tells Marcus quite clearly that the human condition no longer applies to him, and the majority of humans seem to concur. In fact, the notion that Kate and the others would allow a living donor to forfeit his own existence to save another's life, which is precisely what Marcus does for John, represents both a clear breach of medical ethics as well as human rights as we understand them today. To be sure, they deny him his basic rights, including his right to live. Um, so this is the idea of necropolitics that um, we heard about in the introduction. Even as they remain willing to accept his very human sacrifice of donating his own heart to save John Connor. Indeed, by offering himself up as a donor, Mark epitomizes the best of human nature, self-sacrifice, yet his sacrifice is only allowed because he's not recognized as fully human. By the conclusion of the film, Mark is right, even though he may be post-human, establishes that he is not at odds with humanity. Indeed, he ultimately sacrifices himself, like Peck in the Fringe episode, and he turns away from immortality, turning away from a post-human existence toward death. Um, just as Haraway underscores, the relationship between human and machine is not always clear. And when conceptual concerns about creation, the question, for instance, of who makes and who is made are added to this already complex dynamic, answers become even more elusive. While Wright and Peck are fictional characters, the type of ethical quandaries presented in these examples of pop culture may one day come to pass, especially considering the rate with which technology is advancing. Because of this, these characters raise important questions about what it means to be human in the 21st century. In fact, both characters trouble the binaries of human, post-human, man and machine, and thinking and programming. They also cha challenge conventional views on mortality. Indeed, both Wright and Peck work well as cases and points to illustrate how messy these particular categories can get. They also push us to examine what direction our evolution might take and to what extent humans will continue to co-evolve with technology. Thank you.